Hello, YouTube. Hello, Justin. Hello. <laughs> awesome to have you here on the channel and just in a minute on the, on the podcast. So for those of you watching live, please put out questions, comments, thoughts. We'll try to make them part of the show for those of you watching the recording. No live chat, but thanks for being here and checking it out anyway. All right. With that, let's go ahead and kick it off. Justin, welcome to Talk Python to Me. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. I'm a little suspicious. I I got to know. I don't I really know how to test whether you're actually Justin or <laughs> an AI speaking as Justin. Well, yeah, what's the deal here? Yeah, there's no way to know now. <laughs> so we no, just have to accept it. Well, I, is... apparently, I've I've recently learned from you that I can give you a bunch of X's and other arbitrary <laughs> characters. Yeah, yeah, and this is like the the test. It's like asking yeah, Germans to say squirrel in in um, World War II sort of thing. Like. <laughs> It's the test. It's it's yeah. the tell. There's always going to be something. It's some sort of adversarial attack. <laughs> exactly. Oh, it's only going to get more interesting with this kind of stuff, uh, for sure. So we're going to talk about using uh, generative AI and large language models paired with things like pandas or consumed with straight Python with a couple of your projects, which are super exciting. I think it's going to empower a lot of people in ways that it hasn't really been done yet. So awesome on that. But before we get to it, let's start with your story. How did you get into programming in Python? Uh, in see. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, I got into programming in uh, just like when I was a kid, uh, TI-83, uh, learning to code on that. And then uh, sort of just kept it up as a side hobby though my whole life. Uh, didn't ever sort of choose it as my uh, career path or anything for a while. It chose uh, you. <laughs> yeah, it chose me. It just, I dragged it along with me everywhere. It's just like the toolkit. Uh, Mm -hmm. I uh, got a went to undergrad and for physics, electrical engineering, then did a physics PhD, uh, experimental physics. Um, during that, I uh, did a lot of non-traditional languages, uh, things like LabVIEW, Igor Pro, uh, just weird uh, Windows Windows hotkey for like just trying to like automate things. Uh, yeah, sure. So just was sort of dragging that along. Uh, but along that path, I uh, sort of came across uh, GPUs and used it for. Um, uh, accelerating processing, specifically like particle oh, detection. Um, so I was doing some like electron counting in a, uh, some just detector experiments. Wow. And is this uh, like so, CUDA cores on NVIDIA yep. type thing? Precisely. Stuff like that. Okay. That was the, and was that with Python or was that with C++ or what? Uh, at the time it was uh, C++ and I made like a DLL and then called it from LabVIEW, but, uh, <laughs> got a, <laughs> wow, that's some crazy integration. It's like oh. drag and drop programming to yeah, yeah, on it, the memory GPU. Exactly. Yeah, it was it was all over the place. Uh, also had it was a distributed LabVIEW project. We had multiple okay. machines that were coordinating and doing this, um, all just to you know move some motors and measure electrons. But uh, uh, it got me into CUDA stuff, which then at the time was around the time that uh the uh like AlexNet, some of these like very first neural net stuff was happening. And so those same convolutional kernels were the same exact code I was trying to write to run like convolutions on these images. And so I was like, oh, look at this like paper. Oh, let me go read it. It seems like it's got so many citations. This is interesting. And then like that sent me down the rabbit hole of like, oh, this AI stuff. Oh, okay. Let me go deep dive into this. And then that just, I'd say that like became the, the obsession uh, from then. So yeah. it's been like eight years of doing that. Uh, then sort of just after I left uh, academia, tried my own startup, then joined multiple others and just sort of have been bouncing around as the sort of like a like founding engineer, early engineer at a, at startups for a while now. And cool. yeah, Python has been the choice ever since like late grad school and on. Uh, I would say it sort of like came, came through the pandas and NumPy part, but then stuck for the, uh, the scripting, like just power, just can throw anything together at any time. Yeah. So it seems like there were two groups that were just hammering GPUs, hammering them. Crypto miners and AI people. <laughs> but the physicists and, and some of those uh, people doing large-scale research like that, they were the OG um, graphics card users, right? Way before crypto mining existed and really before AI was using graphics cards all that much. I, I think, uh, yeah, I think when I was like looking at some of the code, like pre-CUDA, there were some like quant traders that were doing some like crazy oh, stuff on like were. off of shaders. Like it wasn't even CUDA yet, but it was shaders. And they were trying to like <laughs> extract the compute power out of them from that. So there's like, been... look, if we could shave one millisecond off this, we can short them all day. Let's do it. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. the, yeah, 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 the yeah. physicist in okay. me has always been like, yeah, it's always the get as much compute as you can out of the 
you know devices you have because you get simulations sure. are slow yeah i remember when i was in grad school studying math actually senior year of regular college my bachelor's uh, the research team that I was on had had gotten a used silicon graphics computer for a quarter million dollars and some Onyx workstations that we all were given to. I'm like, this thing is so awesome. Like a couple of years later, like an NVIDIA graphics card and like a, a simple <laughs> PC would crush it. <laughs> like that's two thousand dollars. It's just, yeah, th there's so much power in those things that, to be able to harness them for whatever. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, as long as you don't have too much branching, it works really well. <laughs> Awesome. So let's uh, jump in and start talking about. Uh, let's start talking about ChatGP and and some of this AI stuff before we totally get into the projects that you're working on, which brings that type of conversational generative AI to things like pandas, uh, as you said. But you know, to me, I don't know how. Maybe you've been more on the inside than I have, but to me, it looks like AI has been one of those things that's 30 years in the future forever, right? It was like the Turing test and, oh, here's a chat. I'm going to talk to this thing and see if it feels human or not. And then, you know, there was like OCR and, and then all of a sudden we got drive self-driving cars. Like, wait a minute, that's actually solving real problems. And then we got things like chat GDP where people are like, wait, this can do my job. <laughs> it, it seems like it just in the last couple of years, there's been some inflection point in, in this world. What do you think? Yeah, uh, I think there's sort of like two key things that have sort of happened in the past, uh, I guess, uh, four or five years, uh, four years, roughly. Uh, one is the uh, attention. Uh, attention is all you need paper from Google. Uh, sort of this, this transformer architecture came out and it's sort of a good uh very hungry model that can just sort of absorb a lot of facts and uh, just like a nice learnable key value store almost uh, that's stacked. Okay. Uh, so, and then the other thing is, is the GPUs. We were sort of just talking about GPU compute, but uh, this has just been uh, really, GPU compute has really been growing so fast. If you like look at the like Moore's law equivalent type things, like it's just, it's, it's faster how much we're getting flops out of these things like faster and faster. So uh, it's been, really nice uh, i mean obviously there'll be a wall eventually but it's been uh it's been good riding this like exponential curve for a bit yeah is uh the benefit that we're getting from the faster gpus is that because people are able to program it better and the frameworks are getting better or because just the raw processing power is getting uh, better uh all of the above uh okay I, uh, I think that uh, there was a paper that tried to dissect this. I, I wish I knew the reference, uh, but I believe that the, their argument was that it was actually more the processing power uh, was getting mm -hmm. better. The actual like physical silicon, we're getting better at making that for specifically this type of stuff. Um, but like the it, power on, on exponentials, yeah. but yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The power that those things take. I have a, a gaming system over there, and it has a geforce 2070 super i don't know what the super really gets me but it's better than the not super i guess <laughs> anyway that one still plugs into the wall normal but the the newer ones like the 4090s those things and the the amount of power they consume it's like space heater level of power <laughs> like, i don't know 800 watts or something just for the gpu it's <laughs> yeah. you're gonna brown out the house if you like plug in too many of those yeah uh Go look it's at crazy. those uh, DGX uh, A100 clusters, and they've got like eight of eight of those A100s just stacked right in there. They they take really beefy power supplies. <laughs> it's uh, built right cooling. directly attached to the the power the, the power plant, yeah. <laughs> electrical yeah. power plant. <laughs> Nuts. Okay, so yeah, so those things are getting really really massive. Here's the paper. Uh, Attention is all you need uh, mm -hmm. from Google Research. What was the story of that? Like, where's how's um, that play into things? Yeah, so this uh, came up during like machine translation uh, sort of research at uh, uh, Google, and uh, the core thing is is they they present this idea of uh, instead of just stacking these like layers of neural nets like we're sort of used to, uh, they replace the like neural net layer with this concept of a, uh, a transformer block. Uh, transformer mm -hmm. block has this uh, concept inside that's an attention mechanism. The attention mechanism is effectively uh, three uh, three matrices that you combine in a specific order. Uh, and the, the sort of logic is it is that one of the vectors takes you from some space to uh, keys. So it's almost like it's like identifying labels out of your data. Another one is 
taking you from your data to queries. And then it like dot products those to find a weight. And then for the mm -hmm. one, and then another one finds weight uh, values for your things. So it takes this query and key, you get the weights for them. And then you take the ones that were sort of the closest to get those values from the third matrix. And yeah. just doing it sort of like looks a little bit like a, uh, ac you know, accessing an element in a dictionary, like, you know, key value lookup. Yeah, yeah. And uh, okay. they, it's a differentiable version of that. And it did really well on their machine learning. Oh, sorry, on their uh, machine translation stuff. This was, uh, I think it's uh, the, like one of the first big ones is this BERT model. Um, and uh, that paper sort of, uh, yeah, uh, the architecture of the actual neural net code is effectively unchanged from this to chat GPT. Like there's a lot of stuff for like milking performance and increasing stability, but the actual like core essence of the actual mechanism that drives it, it's the same thing since this paper. Interesting. It's funny that Google didn't release something sooner. <laughs> <laughs> it's wild that they've had, uh, they keep showing off that they've got like equivalent or better things at different times, but then not releasing it. Uh, when Dolly happened, they had Imogen, uh, Im Imagine, I guess, I don't know how you say it. And uh, uh, what was the party as the two? So they had two different, really good, way better than Dolly, way better than stable diffusion models uh, mm -hmm. like the that had were out. And they like showed it, demoed it, like, but never released it to be used. So yeah, it's one of these, who knows what's going to happen with Google if they keep holding on to these things. Yeah, well, I think there was some hesitation I don't know, holds up on accuracy or weird stuff like that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, now cat's out of the bag now. Now it's happening. Yeah, the, the cat's out of the bag and, and people are racing to 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 do the best they can. Mm -hmm. And it's going to have interesting consequences for us, both positive and negative, I think. But, you know, it, let's leverage the positive once the cat's out of the bag anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> Might as well, like, ask it questions for pandas. So... Let's play a little bit with ChatGDP and maybe another one of these um, image type things. So, so I, I came in here and I stole this example from a blog post. It's pretty nice about not using deeply nested codes. So you can use a design pattern called a guarding clause that will look and say if the conditions are not right, we're going to return early instead of having if something, if that also, if something else. So there's this example that is written in a poor way and it says like it's checking for a platypus. So it says if self dot is mammal, if self dot has fur, if self dot has beak, et cetera, et cetera. It's all deeply nested. And just for people who haven't played with chat GDP, like I put that in and I said, sure, I told her I wanted to call this arrow because it looks like an arrow. And it says, um, it tells me a little bit about this. So I'm going to ask it, please rewrite um, arrow to be less nested with guarding clauses, right? This is like a machine, right? If I tell it this, what is it going to say? Let's see. It may fail, but it might. I think it's going to get it. It's thinking. I put it. I mistakenly put it into chat GDP4, which takes longer. <laughs> I might switch <laughs> it over to three. I don't know. But the the understanding of these things, um, there's a lot of hype about it. Like, but you, I think you kind of agree with me that maybe this hype is is worthwhile. Here we go. So, um, look look at this. It it rewrote it said def if is platypus. If not self is man, I'll return false. If not has fur, and there's no more nesting. That's pretty cool, right? Yep. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you've 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 played with stuff like this, right? Where you, yep. you've um, yeah, so this is like kind. I mean, this is kind of interesting, right? Like it understood there was a structure and it understood what these were and it understood what I said. But what's more impressive is like, please rewrite the program to check for crocodiles, crocodiles. And you know it. What what is it going to do here? Let's let's see. It says sure, no problem. Then writes the function is crocodile. If not self dot is reptile. If not self dot has scales. If not self dot has long snout. Oh my gosh! Like it not only remembered. Oh yeah, there's this new version I wrote in the garden clause format. But then it rewrote the tests. I mean, and then it's explaining to me why it wrote it that way. It's just it's mind blowing. Like how how much you can have conversations with this and how much it understands things like code or physics or history. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's really satisfying. I love that it, 
it's such a powerful generalist at these like things that are found on the internet. So if it like, if it exists and it's in the training data, it can do so good at synthesizing, mm -hmm. composing, bridging between them. It's really satisfying. So, uh, I, it's really fun asking it to, as, as you're doing rewriting, uh, changing language. I I've been getting into a lot more JavaScript because I'm doing a bunch more like front end stuff. And just, I sometimes will write a quick one liner in Python that I know how to do with, a. Uh, like list comprehension and then i'll be like make this for me in javascript because i can't figure out this like how to initialize an array with integers in it <laughs> uh, yeah it's, it's yeah, great yeah. for just like really quick spot checks um and it also seems to know a lot about like really popular frameworks so you can ask it things that are surprisingly detailed about like a you know, how would you do cores with requests in uh, fast api yeah and it can yeah. it can help you find that exact middleware that uh you know it's like boilerplatey but it's great that uh it can just be a source for that it's it's insane i don't know if i've got it in my yeah, yeah in my history here we're we're rewriting our mobile apps for talk by the train for our courses in in flutter and we're having a problem downloading stuff concurrently using a particular library in flutter and so i asked it i said hey uh, I want some help with a Flutter and Dart program. Says, what do you want? It says, uh, I'm using the I'm using the DIO package. Do you know it? Oh yes, I'm familiar. It does HTTP client stuff for Dart. Okay, I want to download binary video files and a bunch of them given a URL. I want to do them concurrently with three of them at a time. Write the code for that, and boom, it just writes it. Like using that library I told it about, not just Dart. So, I think that's just that's incredible that we can get this kind of assistance for. Mm -hmm for knowledge and programming. Like you'll never find, I mean, I take that back. You might find that if there's a very specific stack overflow question or something, but if there's not a right on question for it, you're not going to find it. Yep. Yep. It's the, uh, yeah, I love the, when you have a, the, like, you know, the stack overflow would exist for a variant of your question, but yes. it's like the exact one doesn't exist and you have to go grab like the three of them to synthesize. And it's just great at that. Uh, it's also, yeah, it also is pretty good at fixing errors. I mean, sometimes it can walk itself into just like lying to you repeatedly, but that's, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, <laughs> that's that accuracy. It's so problematic. Yeah. yeah. But you can also ask it like, here's my program. Are there security vulnerabilities or do you see any bugs? And it'll, it'll find them. Yep. yep. Yeah. It's, uh... it's, it's nuts. So people may be wondering, we haven't talked yet about your, your project sketch while we're, I'm talking so much about chat CP. So like that is kind of the, the style of AI that your project brings to pandas, which we're going to get to, but I want to touch on two more really quick AI things that we'll, we'll dive into it. The other is this just around images, just the, the ability to ask questions. You've already mentioned uh, three Dolly, uh, imagine. And then the other one, I don't remember from Google that they haven't put out yet. Uh, and mid journey is another, like just the ability to say, Hey, I want a picture of this. No, actually change it slightly like that. It's, it's mind blowing. Yeah, it's very, uh, they're a lot of fun. They're great for like, sparking creativity or having an idea and just getting to see it in front of you. I think it's more impressive to me than even this this chat GDP telling me how to write Dart is because it's like, I gave you a blank canvas. And, and so for example, for this video, for this uh, I, this um, this conversation, I'll probably use this as the YouTube thumbnail and image <laughs> uh, for the this episode. So I want an artificial intelligence panda <laughs> and it came up and I wanted photorealistic in the style of National Geographic. And so it gave me this panda. You can see like beautiful whiskers, but like just behind the ear, you can see the fur is gone. And it's like, like a, an Android type of creature. Yeah. Um, that's incredible. I mean, that is a, a beautiful picture. It's pretty accurate. It's like, it's nuts that I can just go talk to these systems and ask them these questions. Yeah. I, uh, I find it interesting you're comparing the chat GPT and the, uh, uh, the mid journey style and find the mid journey ones, uh, impressive. They are like, I, I completely get it. Like it's very visceral. Uh, it's also from like another perspective. I, I think of like the weights and the scale of the model mm -hmm. and the mid, you know, these like image ones that like solve all images are so much smaller in scale than these like mm -hmm. language ones that have all this other data and stuff. So it's fascinating. Yeah, I know the smarts is so languages. much less, but just something yeah. about it actually came up with a creative mm -hmm. picture that never existed. Yeah. Right. You could show this to somebody be like, oh, that's an artificial panda. That's insane. Right. But it's, but I just gave it like a sentence or two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, I don't know. 
yeah, this uh, <laughs> it's a sort of a technical interpretation, but I I love it because it's like this. It's just phenomenal interpolation. It's like through semantically labeled space. So like the the words have meaning, and it understands the meaning and can move sliders of like. Well, I've seen lots of these machine things. I understand the concept of gears and this metal and this like the shiny texture and then the fur yeah. texture and like a specific, <laughs> they're very good at texture. <laughs> uh, and so yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, really great how uh, it interprets all of that just to fit the you know, the small prompt. Yeah, there are other angles in which it's frustrating. Like, I want it turn. I want it in the back of the picture, not the. No, it, it's always in the center. Uh, one more thing, really quick, uh, and this leads me into my final thing is is uh, GitHub Copilot. GitHub Copilot is like this in your editor, which is kind of insane, right? You can just mm -hmm. give it like a comment or a series of comments, and it will write it. I think ChatGPT is maybe more open ended and more creative, but this is this is also a pretty interesting. I Wait, I'm a heavy user of Copilot. I it is I would if there is a there's a weird crux and I'm like slowly developing like a, a need to have this in my browser. I was a uh, uh, on a on a flight recently and was with, with the internet and uh, Copilot wasn't working and I felt <laughs> the like I felt the difference. I felt like I was like walking through mud instead of just like actually running a little bit. And I was like, oh, I've been <laughs> been disconnected from my distributed mind. I am broken yep. <laughs> partially. <laughs> yeah. So incredible. Uh, um, so the last part, I guess, is like, you know, what are the ethics of this? Like, I went on very positively about Mid Journey, but how much of that is trained on copyright material? Or there's GitHub Copilot. How much of that is trained on GPL-based stuff that was in GitHub? But when I use it, I don't have the GPL any longer on my code. I might use it on commercial code. But just running it through the AI, does that strip licenses or does it not? There's uh, GitHub Copilot litigation.com, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, we might be finding out. There's also, uh, I think, Getty. I think it's the Getty Images. I'm not 100% sure, but I think Getty Images is suing one of these image generation companies. I can't remember which one. I don't, maybe Mid Journey. I don't think it's Mid Journey. I think it's Stable Diffusion. But anyway, it doesn't really matter. Like there's there's a bunch of things that are pushing back against us. Like, wait a minute, <laughs> where did you get this data? Did you have rights to use this data in this way? And I mean, what are your thoughts on this, this angle of AI these days? Yeah. Uh... I know it sounds like I like I don't have I don't I don't worry too much about it in either direction. I like I I think I believe in like I get eth like personal ethics. I believe in open source things, availability of things because it just sort of yeah. like accelerates collective progress. Uh, but that said, I also believe in like slightly different like social uh, structures to help support people. Like like uh, I I'm a I guess a personal believer in things like UBI or something like that on that direction. Mm -hmm. And so I, when you combine those, I feel like it, you know, things sort of work out kind of well, but when we like, but it is still a thing that like copyright exists and that there, there is this sense of ownership and this is my thing. And I wanted to put licenses on it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's, I think that this sort of story started presumably that you know, I wasn't really having this conversation, but like when the internet came around and search engines happened and like yeah. Google could just go and pull up your thing from your page and summarize it in a little blob on the page is, was that fair? What if it starts, you know, your shop and it allows you to go buy yeah. that same product from other shops. Like it, I, I think that yeah. the same yeah. things are showing up and in the same way that the web, like in the internet sort of, it's sort of, it was a large thing, but then it sort of, I don't know if it got quieter, but it sort of, became in the background, we sort of found new systems. It stopped being piracy and CDs and the music industry is going to struggle. And hey, things like Spotify exist and streaming services right. exist. And like, I don't know what the next way ever, is. Basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I think it's just evolution. Uh, and like some things, some things will change and adopt. Some things will like fall apart and new things will be born. I, it's just a great, sure. it's a good time for lots of opportunity, I guess is the, the I, part I that I'm excited about. Yeah, 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 for sure. I think that's definitely true. It probably you're probably right it probably will turn out to be you know old man yells at cloud cloud doesn't care sort of story you know in the end where it's like um on the other hand if if somebody came back and said you know a, a court came back and said you know what actually anything trained on gpl and then you use copilot on it that's gpl like that would have instantly mega effects right <laughs> yeah <laughs> i yeah and i 
I guess there's also stuff like the, I don't, I didn't actually read the article. I only saw the headline. And yeah, that's the worst thing to do is to repeat a thing, which is a headline. But uh, there was that Italy thing that I saw about, uh, yeah. like, uh, I don't know the extent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was really clickbaity, but I didn't get a time to look at it yet. So yeah, you probably asked chat GDP to summarize it for you. <laughs> uh, if, as long as it can you know, Bing, I guess, get that updated. Search, yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of things playing in that space, right? Some different places. Um, okay, so yeah, very cool. But as a regular user, I would say, you know, regardless of kind of how you feel about this, at least this is my my viewpoint right now. It's like regardless of how I feel about which side is right in these kinds of disputes, this stuff is out of the bag. Um, it's it's out there and available, and it's a tool. And it's like saying, you know, I don't want to use spell check or I don't want to use um some kind of like code checking. I just want to write like in straight notepad because it's pure, right? Like sure you could do that, but there's these tools that will help us be more productive and it's better to embrace them and know them than to just like yell at them, I suppose. <laughs> there's a, yeah, a lot of accelerant you can get, uh, really speed up whatever you want to get done. Uh, yeah, absolutely. All right. So speaking of speeding up things, let's talk pandas yeah. and, and not even my artificial pandas but actual programming pandas <laughs> with this project that you all have from uh, approximate lab approximate yeah approximate labs um called sketch so sketch is pretty awesome sketch is actually why we're talking today because i first talked about this on python bytes and i saw this was sent over there by jake Furman and to me and said you should check this thing out it's awesome and uh yeah, it's it's pretty nuts. So tell us about Sketch. Yeah. So uh, I even though I use uh, Copilot as, as sort of described already, and it's become a crux. Uh, I found in Jupyter Notebooks uh, when I wanted to work with data, uh, it just didn't. It, it doesn't actually apply. Uh, that so on one side, it is sort of like missing the mark at times. Uh, and so it was sort of like, how can I get this integrated into my uh, my flow, the way I actually work in a Jupyter yeah. Notebook. If maybe I'm working a Jupyter Notebook on a remote server and I don't want to set up VS Code to do it, so I don't have Copilot at all. Like, there's a bunch of different reasons that I was just like in Jupyter. It's a very different IDE experience. It is, yeah, um, it's super different. But also, mm -hmm. you you might want to ask questions about the data, not the structure of the code that analyzes the data, right? Exactly. Yeah, and so just a bunch of that type of stuff. Uh, and then also at the other side, uh, I was. <laughs> this sounds. Uh, I I was trying to find something that I could throw together that I thought was a strong demonstration of the value uh, Approximate Labs is trying to chase, uh, yeah. but wouldn't take me too much time to make. So it was a, uh, oh, I could probably just go throw this together pretty quickly. I bet this is going to be actually useful and helpful. And so uh, let's just do that. And so uh, through uh, on top of the actual library I was using that was Sketch, I put this on it and then shipped it. So sort of shifted <laughs> what the project was. Yeah, yeah. So you also have this other project uh, called Lambda Prompt. And so were you, yeah. were you trying to play around with Lambda Prompt and then like see what you could kind of apply here to leverage it? Yeah. Or is that the uh, yeah, yeah. The full the full journey uh, I can get into is uh, started with uh, data sketches. Uh, after left uh, left my last job uh, to chase uh, bringing the algorithm like, like combining data sketches with AI, with just like the vague like at that mm -hmm. level. Uh, you know, have Still a sort of data like, sketches is real quick. Sure, yeah. So a data sketch is a, a, a probabilistic aggregation of data. So if you have a, uh, I think the most common one that people have heard of is hyperloglog, log, uh, and it's used to estimate cardinality. So estimate the number of unique values in a column. Uh, a, a data sketch is a class of algorithms that all sort of like use roughly fixed width in binary, usually, uh, representations. And then uh, in a single pass, so they're ON, uh, we'll look at each row and hash the row and then update the sketch or not necessarily hash but they update this this sketch object essentially uh and the uh, those sketch objects also have another property that they are mergeable so you have this like really fast on to go bring that like to aggregate up and you get this uh mergeability so you can map reduce it in you know trivial speeds uh the net result is that this like tight binary packed object uh can be used to approximate measures you were uh, looking for uh, on the original data. So you could look at, if you do a few of these, uh, they're called like theta sketches, you can go and estimate not just the unique count, but you can also estimate if this one column would join well with this other column. Or you can estimate, oh, 
if I were to join this column to this column, then this third column that was on that other table would actually be correlated to this first column over here. So you get these like uh, a bunch of different uh, distributions. You get a whole bunch of these types of properties. Um, and each sketch is sort of just, I would say, algorithmically engineered, like very, very engineered to be uh, like information theory optimal at solving one of those like measures on the data. And so okay. tight packed uh, binary representations. All right. So you thought about, well, that's cool, but ChatGDP is cool too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <What else? laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, the the core thing was, um, so uh, those those representations uh, aren't aren't usable by AI right now. And when you actually go and use GPT three or something like this, you have to uh, uh, figure out a way to build the prompt to get it to do what you want. Uh, this was especially true. Uh, in a in a pre instruction tuning world, you had to really like you had to play the 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 prompt engineer role even more than you have to now. Now you can sort of get away with describing it to ChatGPT. Um, and one of the things that you really have to like play the game of is how do you get all the information it's going to need into this prompt in a succinct but good enough way that it helps it do this. Uh, and so yeah. uh, what Sketch was about was. Uh, rather than just looking at the context of the data, like the metadata, the column names, and the code you have, also go get some representations of representation of the content of the data, uh, turn that into a string, and then bring that string in as part of the prompt. And then when it has that, it should understand uh, much better at actually generating code, generating uh, answers to questions. And that's what that sketch was a proof of concept of that that worked very well. It really cool. quickly showed how valuable. Uh, yeah, actual data content context is. Yeah, I would say people are it's resonating with people. It's got one point five thousand stars on GitHub, yeah. and it looks about six months old. So uh, that's, that's pretty good growth there. <laughs> yeah, uh, January sixteenth was the day I posted it on Hacker News, and it had three. <laughs> there was an empty repo at that point. Uh, <laughs> okay, so. three stars. It's like me and my friends. Yep. Okay, <laughs> um, cool. So this is a. A tool that basically patches pandas to add functionality or functions, to, literally, to pandas data frames that allows you to ask questions about it, right? Yep. Uh, so what yeah. kind of questions can you ask it and what what can it help you with? Yeah, so, uh, so there's two classes of questions you can ask. You can ask it the ask type questions. These are sort of from that summary statistics data. So from the general you know, representation of your data, uh, ask it to like give you answers about it. Like what are the columns here? You sort of have a conversation where it sort of understands the general under like shape of the data, general distributions, things like that, um, number of uniques and like give that context to it, ask questions of that system. Uh, and then the other one is ask it how to do something. So you specifically can get it to write code to solve a problem you have. You describe the problem you want and you can ask it to do that. Uh, All right, I've got this data frame. I want to, I want to plot a graph of this versus that, but color by the other thing. Yep. Um, and in the data space world, what I sort of decided to do is like in the demo here is uh, just sort of walk through what are some standard things people want to ask of data? Like, it, like what are those common questions that you hear like in Slack between a you know like a business team and a analyst team? Um, and it's just sort of like, oh, can you do this? Can you get me this? Uh, can you can you tell me if there's any PII? Is this safe to send? Can I send the CSV around? Uh, can right. you clean up this uh, CSV? Uh, oh, I need to load this into our catalog. Can you describe each of these columns and check the data types? Uh, all the way to, can you actually go get me analytics or plot this? Yeah, yeah. awesome. So, and it plugs right into Jupyter Notebooks. So you can just import it and, and basically installing Sketch, which is a pip or conda type thing and then you just import it and it's good to go right yep um using the uh the pandas extensions api which allows you to essentially hook into their data frame uh callback and register a, a, a you know a uh, interesting so it's not as um jammed on from the outside it's a little more plays a little nicer with pandas rather than just like we're gonna go to to the class and just Hack on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, not full monkey patching here. It's a, uh, it's like half supported. I think I, I don't, th I don't see it used often, but uh, it is somewhere in the docs. 
Excellent. But here it is. So what I wanted to do for this is there's a, an example that you can do. Like if you go to the repo, which obviously I'll link to, there's a video, which I mean, mad props to you because I review so many things, especially for the Python Bytes podcast, where it's a bunch of news items and new things we're just going to check out. And we'll, we'll find people recommending GUI frameworks that have not a single screenshot or <laughs> other types of things. Like, I have no way to judge whether this thing even might look like. So what does it even make? I don't even know, but somebody put a lot of effort, but they didn't bother to post an image. And you posted a, a minute and a half animation of it going through this process, which is really, really excellent. So people can go and watch that one minute, one minute 30 video. But there's also a collab open in Google Colab, which gives you a, a running interactive variant here. So you can just follow along, right? And um, uh, play these play these pieces. Oh, it requires me to sign up on and run it, but that's okay. So let me let me just talk people through come some of the things it does, and you can tell me what it's doing, how it's doing that, like how people might find that advantageous. So import sketch, import pandas as PD standard. And then you can say pandas read CSV and you give it one from a like a some example CSV that you got on your one of your GitHub repos, right? Or in yep. your account. Yeah, I found one online and then added just random synthetic data to it. Yeah. Like, oh, here's a data dump. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so then you need to go to that data frame called sales data. You say dot sketch dot ask as a string, what columns might have PII personal identifying information? in them um awesome and so it comes tell, tell me how that works and what, what it's doing here yep so uh it it does i guess uh it has to build up the prompt which is sent to gpt so uh to open ai's specific completion endpoint uh mm -hmm. the building up the prompt it looks at the data frame uh it does a bunch of summarization stats on it so it calculates uh uniques and sums and things like that. Uh, there's two modes in the back end that uh, either it does sketches to do those or it just uses uh, like df.describe type stuff. Uh, and then it pulls those uh, summary stats together for all the columns, uh, throws it together with my uh, the rest of the prompt uh, I have. You can, we can go find it. But uh, then uh, it sends that prompt. Uh, actually, it, it also grabs some information off of uh, inspect. So it sort of like walks the... Uh, the stack up to go and check the variable name because the data frame is named sales data. So it actually look, tries to go find that variable name in your uh, call stack so that it can, when it writes code, it writes valid code. Uh, puts all that together, sends it off to OpenAI, gets code back, uh, uses Python AST to parse it, check that it's valid. If it's not valid Python code or you tried to import something that you don't have, it will uh, ask it to rewrite once. So this is sort of uh, like an iterative uh, process. So it takes the error or it takes the thing and it sends it back to OpenAI. So it's like, hey, fix this code. And then it, uh, or uh, in this case, sorry, ask, it actually just takes this, it sends that exact same prompt, but it just changes the last question to, can you answer this question off of the information yeah, we have? Yeah, yeah. And so that sounds very, very similar to my arrow program. Rewrite it with garden clauses, redo it. <laughs> like, kind of, I, I gave you this data and this code, and I asked you this question, and you can have a little conversation, but at some point, you're like, all right, well, we're going to take what it gives me after a couple of rounds at it, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I take the first one that doesn't, like, it, it, it like passes an import check and passes AST linting. Uh, there yeah. was a, the when you use small models, uh, you run into not valid Python a lot more. But with these ones, it's almost always good. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Okay, so it says the columns that might have PII in them are credit card, SSN, and purchase address. Okay, that's pretty excellent. And then you say, all right, um, sales data dot sketch dot ask. Can you give me friendly names for each column? and output this as an HTML list, which is parsed as HTML and rendered in Jupyter Notebook accurately, right? So it says index, well, that's an index. Uh, um, <laughs> this one ends up being the same. It, it's, it's not a great, uh, this one is not a great example yeah, because yeah. it doesn't have to like infer um, because the names are like okay. order spa space date, right? Instead of order, like maybe lowercase o and then like attached a big mm -hmm. D. Or, whatever but it'll give you some more information you can like kind of ask it questions about the, the type of data right yep uh yeah exactly uh i found this is really good at uh if you play the game and you just name all your columns like 
call one, call two, call three, call four, and you ask it, give me new column names for all of these. It, it gives you something that's pretty reasonable based off of the data. So pretty useful. Okay. So it's like, oh, these look like addresses. So we'll call that address. Yep. And this looks like uh, social security numbers and credit scores and yep. whatnot. Yep. So it can really help with that quick first uh, onboarding step. Yeah. So, all right. Everyone heard, heard it here first. Just name all your columns. One, two, three, four. <laughs> and, and then just get help. Like you, AI, what do we call these? <laughs> All right. So the next thing you did in this uh, demo notebook was you said sales data dot sketch dot. And this is different um, before, I believe, because before yep. you were saying ask yep. and now you can say how to create some derived features from the from the address. Tell us about that. Yeah. So uh, this is the one that actually is the code writing. Um, it's essentially the exact same prompt, but uh, the change is the very end. It says, like, return this as Python code that you can execute to do this. So instead of answering the question directly, answer the question with code that will answer the question. Right. Um, we'll write a Python line of code that will answer this question, given this data, yeah. something like that. Yep, yep, something like that. Okay. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly anymore. It's been a while. But uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, some I've iterated a little bit until it started working. And I was like, okay, cool. Um, and so uh, uh, ask it for that. And then it spits back code. Um, and uh, that was, it sort of, it sounds overly simple, but that was it. That was like, that was the moment. And I was just like, oh, I could just ask it to do my analytics for me. And it's just all the, every other feature just sort of became like apparently solvable with this. Um, and the more I played with it, the more it was just, Oh, I don't have to. I don't have to think about. I don't even have to go to Google or Stack Overflow to ask the question to get the API stuff for me. I could uh, from zero to I have code that's working is one yeah. step in Jupyter. So, so you wrote that how to, and you gave it the question, and then it wrote the lines of code, and you just drop that into the next cell and just yep. run it, right? And so, for exa in this example, it said, "Well, we can come up with city, state, and zip code, and by writing a a." Um, vector transform by passing a lambda that'll pull out you know the city from the string that was the full address and so on right yeah that's but, pretty uh, that's pretty neat <laughs> yeah it's fun to see what it what it does uh, not again not any of these things are always probabilistic but it it also usually serves as a great starting point if even if it doesn't get it right yeah sure You're like oh, okay i see maybe that's not exactly right because we have europeans in their city maybe uh, yeah. and their zip code are in different orders sometimes. Um, but mm -hmm. it gives you something to work with pretty quickly, right? By asking just a, what can I do? Yep. And then another one, this one's a little more interesting. Instead of just saying like, well, what, what other things can we pull out? It's like, kind of, this gets towards the analytics side, right? It says get the top five grossing states for the sales data, right? And it writes a, a group by some sorts, and then it does a, a head given five. And yeah, that's that's pretty neat. Tell us about this. I mean, I guess it's about the yeah. same, right? Just asking yeah. more deep I, questions. They all, sort of, <laughs> they all feel pretty similar to me. Uh, I think, uh, I, I guess I could jump towards like things that I wanted to put next, uh, but I didn't, we're not reliable enough to like really make the cut. Uh, I wanted to have it go like, in my question was like, go build a model that predicts sales for the next six months and then plot it on like on a, you know, 2D plot with a dotted line for the predicted yeah. uh, plot. And like it would try, but it would it would always do something off. And I found I always had to break up the prompt into like get, smaller, it, smaller, get intern level code back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, so, ah, it sort uh, of works. So yeah, yeah. The real uh, data. It, it was fun getting it to train models, but it was also its own like separate thing I sort of didn't play with uh, too much. And uh, uh, so that that's that. Uh, there's another part of Sketch that I guess is not in this notebook, I didn't realize. Uh, yeah. Because you have to use the OpenAI API key, but it's uh, the Sketch apply. And that's the, um, I'll say this one is another just like power tool. This one has, like it, I don't really talk about, I don't even include it in the video because uh, it's not just like as plug and play. You do have to go, set an environment variable and so it's like that's uh -huh. eh, one step further than i want to I I it's not terrible but it's a step um and so right. uh but what it what it does is it lets you apply a uh a completion endpoint of whatever your design row wise so every single row you can go and apply and run something so if every row of your pandas data frame is a uh i don't know uh some serialized text from a PDF or something or a file in your directory structure uh, and you just load it as a data frame, you can do dot df dot uh, df dot sketch dot apply and it's almost the exact same as df dot apply. 
but the thing you've put in as your function is now just a Jinja template that will fill in your uh, column variables for that row and then ask mm -hmm. GPT to continue completing. Um, so I think I, I did silly ones like here's a few states and then the, the prompt is extract the state for it or so I think. Right, extract yeah. the capital of the state, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so um, uh, just pure information extraction from it, but you can sort of like this so, grows into a lot more. So does that come out of the data or is that coming out of uh, open AI where like it sees where's the capital of state and it sees New York, it's like, okay, well, all right, Albany. Yeah, like yeah right it's, so. this is purely extracting out of the model weights, essentially. This is not like a factual extraction. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is probably a bad example because it's like it. But the thing that actually, uh, actually the better example I did once was uh, what is like some interesting colors that are uh, good for each state? And it like just came up with a sort of okay. like flaggish colors or sports team colors. That was sort of fun mm -hmm. when it wrote that as hex. Um, you can also do things like if you have a large text document uh, or you can uh, actually, I'll even do the more common one that I think everybody actually wants is uh, you have messy data. You have addresses that are like syntactically messy and you could say normalize these addresses to be in this form. And you sort of just write one example and say run dot apply and you get a new column that is that uh, cleaned up data. <laughs> yeah. So. Incredible. Okay. A um, couple things here. It says I can uh, use can directly call the open AI and not use your endpoint. So at the moment, it kind of proxies through a web service that you all have that somehow checks stuff or what does that do? Uh, yeah, it was just a pure ease of use. I wanted people to be able to do pip install and import sketch and actually get it because I, I know how much I use things in in uh, Colab or in Jupyter Notebooks on weird machines and remembering an environment variable, managing secrets. It's like this whole overhead that I don't oh, want to yeah. deal with. And so I wanted yeah. to just offer a lightweight way if you just wanted to be able to use it. Um, but I know that that's not sufficient for secure. Whatever. If people are going to be conscious of these things and want to be able to, you know, not go through my proxy thing that's there for help. So I uh, sure. offer this up. Um, what's next? Do you, got a, do you have a roadmap for this? Are you happy where it is and you're just letting it be? Or yeah, do you have uh, I, don't, plans? <laughs> I don't have much of a roadmap for this right now. Uh, I'm actually, I guess... There's like grand roadmap, which is like at the company scale, what we're working on. Uh, I would say that if this, uh, we're really trying to solve data and with AI just in general. And so these are the types of things we hope to open source and just give out there. Like actually everything we're hoping to open source. But uh, the, uh, the starting place is going to be a bunch of these like smaller toolkits or just utility things that hopefully save people time or very useful. The grand thing we're working towards, I guess, is this... Uh, more like the it's the full automated data stack it's like the dream i think that people have wanted where you just ask it questions and it goes and pulls the data that you need it cleans it it builds up the full pipeline it executes the pipeline it gets you to the result and it shows you the result and you look you can inspect all of that that whole dag and say yes i trust this um so we're nice. working on getting you know full end to end so when i went asked about that arrow program i said i think this will still do it i think this will probably work again <laughs> and it did which is awesome just the way i expected <laughs> but you know ai is not as deterministic as you know read the number seven if seven is less than eight do this right like what is the repeatability what is the the sort of experience of doing this like i ran it oh, i ran it again I, is it going to be pretty much the same or is it going to have like what's the mood of the ai when it gets yeah. to you uh, I guess, yeah, this this is sort of a parameter you can, there's a little bit of a parameter you can set if you want to play that game with the temperature parameter um, on these models. Um, at higher and higher temperatures, you get more and more random, but it can also truly be out of left field random if you go too high temperature. Um, okay. just like, but you get maybe more creative solutions. But you could, yeah, you could sometimes get that. And as you move towards zero, it gets more and more deterministic. Uh, unfortunately, for for really trying to do some like good provable, like sort of like, build chain type things with like hashing and caching and stuff uh you, you it's not fully deterministic even at zero temperature but uh sure. that's just uh, i think it's worth thinking about but at the same time run it once see the answers that it gives you comment that business out and just like put that as markdown <laughs> you know <laughs> freeze it and like as, memorialize it in markdown and, yeah. and then because because you don't need to ask it over and over what columns have pii like well, probably the same ones as last time. <laughs> We're just going to like write these columns, credit card, social security, and purchase address. They have 
have that. And so now you know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's Is always that a reasonable way to think about it. I, I think, uh, yeah, if you, if you want to get uh, determinism or the performance is a thing that you're worried about, yeah, you can always cache. <laughs> I think uh, yeah. however you do it, comments or actually with systems. Sure, sure, sure. Or that like, like how do I, uh, you know, how do I do that group by sorting business? Like you don't have to ask that over and over. Once it gives you the answer. Yeah, just... actually, yeah, my workflow when I use Sketch, uh, definitely I ask the question, I copy the code and then I go delete the question or ask it a different question for my next problem that I have. Yeah. Uh, I, I like, I don't really, it's not a, it's not code that, it is a little bit like uh, vestigial when it when you like save your notebook at the end and you sort of want to go back and delete all the questions you asked because the you know you don't need to rerun it when you actually just go to execute the notebook later. But yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And plus, you look smarter if you don't have to show how you got the answers. <laughs> yeah, just look at this beautiful code that's even commented. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I guess you could probably ask it to comment your code, right? Yeah, if you want to. You can it. ask it to describe. Uh, there's been some really cool things where people. Uh, We'll throw like assembly at it and ask it to translate to different like languages so they can interpret it. Or you know, you could do really fun things like cross language, cross uh, uh, like I guess I'll say like levels of abstraction. You could sort of ask it to describe it like at a very top level, or you can get really precise. Like for this line, what are all the implications if I change a variable or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. I suppose you could do that here. Can you can you like converse with it? You can say, okay, you gave me this. Does it, I guess, what's the word? Does it have like tokens and context like ChatGDP does? Can you, yeah, you yeah. say, okay, that's cool, but but I want uh, it as an integer is not as strings. Or, I don't yeah, know. I, did, I did not include that in this. Uh, there was a, a version that had something like that where I was sort of just keeping the last few calls around, but it quickly became, uh, it didn't align with the Jupyter IDE experience because you end up like scrolling up and down and it, it you have too much power over how you execute in a Jupyter notebook. So your context can change dramatically by just scrolling up and trying to, uh, via inspect, look across different, like uh, across a Jupyter notebook is just a whole other nightmare. So yeah. I, I didn't try and like extract the code out of the notebook so that it could understand the local context. You, you could go straight to ChatGDP or something like that. Take yep. what it gave you and start asking it questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so another question that I had here about this. So in order for it to do its magic, like you said, the really important um, thought or breakthrough or idea you had was like not just the structure of the pandas code or, or anything like that, but also a little bit about the data. Mm -hmm. What is the privacy implications of me asking this question about my data? Suppose I have super duper secret CSV. And <laughs> should I not not ask or how to on it? Or what is the story there? What's yeah. the, the, if I work with data, how much sharing do I do of something I might not want to share if I ask a question yeah. about it? I, I'd say the same discretion you'd use if you would copy like a row, a few rows of that data into, uh, a co uh, into chat GPT to ask it a question about it. Okay. Um, it is the level of, uh, concern, I guess you should have like, uh, on the specifically, uh, I am not, uh, storing these things, but, uh, I know like, and. I know OpenAI uh, uh, is, at least it was, it seems like they're going to start getting towards like a 30 day thing. But uh, so there's a little bit of, yeah, I mean, you're sending your stuff over the wire, like over network, um, if you do this and to use these language models until they come local, until these things like Llama and Alpaca get good enough uh, that they're, yeah, they're going to be remote. Uh, actually, that could be a fun, sorry, <laughs> I just now thought that could be a fun thing, like just go get Alpaca working with uh, Sketch so that it can be fully local. In your oh, interesting, uh, like a privacy preserving yeah, yeah, type just, of deal. Yeah, I hadn't actually. Yeah, that's the that's the power of these uh, smaller models that are almost good enough. I could probably just like quickly throw that in here and see if it uh yeah, yeah. maybe is, has a but wider you, audience you know, of people. You have a uh, option to not go through your API but directly go to OpenAI. Mm -hmm. You could have another one to pick other other options, right? Potentially. Yep. 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 Um, the uh, interface to these. Uh, I, I one thing that I think is not uh, maybe it's talked about it more in other places, but I haven't heard as much like excitement about it. Is that these uh, the APIs have gotten pretty nice for this whole space? Uh, the uh, they're all like the, the idea of a completion endpoint is pretty straightforward. You send it some amount of text, and it will continue that text. And it's such a 
it's so simple, but it's so generalizable. You could build so many tools off of just that one API endpoint, essentially. And mm -hmm. so uh, combine that with an embedding endpoint, and you sort of have all you need to, to make complex AI apps. It's crazy. Speaking of making AI apps, maybe touch a bit on your, your other projects, Lambda yeah, yeah. Prompt. So yeah, Lambda, <laughs> yeah, Lambda and Prompt. By the way, before you get into it, mad props for like Greek <laughs> letter, like that's a true physicist or mathematician. <laughs> I, that, I, I can appreciate that there. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, was, I, I was excited to put it everywhere, but then of course, you know, these things don't, uh, playing, playing games with character sets in websites. I, I'm, I'm the one that causes, I, I both feel the pain, have to clean the data that I also put into these systems. So yeah, yeah. Uh, people are really like a prompt. Why is the A so italicized? I don't yeah, get yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah. So this one came, uh, I was uh, working with, this is pre GPT. Uh, this is uh, October. Uh, I guess it was right around G chat GPT coming out, like around that time. Uh, but I was, I was really just messing around a lot with uh, completion endpoints as we were talking. And I kept rewriting the same request boilerplate over and over. And then I also kept rewriting uh, F strings that I was trying to like send in. And I was just like, oh, Jinja templates solved this already. Like there, there already is formatting for strings in Python. Let me just use that, compose that into a function, and just let me call these completion endpoints. I don't want to think of them as like a API endpoint or RPC is a nice mental model, but I want to use them as functions. I want to be able to put decorators on them. I want to be able to use them both async or uh, not async in Python. Uh, I want to, I just want to have this as a thing that I can just call really quickly with one line and just do whatever I need to with it. And so through this together, it's very simple. Like honest, I mean, like the, the hardest part was just getting all the layers of, uh, uh, there's, there's actually two things. Um, you can make a prompt that then, because uh, I wrap any function as a prompt, so not just uh, these calls to GPT, and then I do tracing on it. So as you like get into the call stack, every input and output is you can sort of like get hooked into and, and trace uh, with some like call traces. Uh, and uh, so there's a bunch of just like weird stuff to make the utility nice, but functionally, as you can see here, on uh, it's you just import it. You write a Jinja template with the class, and then you use that object that comes back as a function. And yeah. your Jinja template variables get filled in, and your result is the text string that comes back out of uh, GPT. It's interesting. You know, people probably, some people might be thinking like Jinja. Okay, well, I got to create an HTML file and all that. Like, not just a string that has <laughs> double curlies for turning stuff into like strings yeah. within the string. Kind of uh, a different way to do F strings, as you were hinting at. Yeah, yeah. I there was uh, two pieces here. I realized as I was, I was doing this, also I, I think I sort of mentioned with a uh, uh, sketch. I do. I really often was taking the output of a language model prompt, doing something in Python, or actually I can do a full example of the SQL writing like exploration we did. But um, we would do these things uh, that were sort of run GPT three to ask it to uh, write the SQL. You take the SQL, you go. Uh, try and execute it, but it fails for whatever reason. Um, or you and you take the error, you say, hey, rewrite it. So we talked about that sort of pattern, which mm -hmm. is sort of like rewriting. Another one of the patterns was uh, increase the temperature, ask it to write the SQL. You get like 10 different SQL answers in parallel. And this is where the async was like really important for this because I just wanted to use async IO gather and run all 10 of these truly in parallel against the open AI endpoint. Um, get 10 different answers to the SQL, run all 10 queries against your database, uh, then pool on what the most common, like of the ones that successfully ran, which ones gave the same answer the most often. I see. And that's probably yeah. the correct answer. And uh, just chaining that stuff, it's like very Pythonic functions. Like you can really just imagine like, oh, I just need to write a for loop. I just need to you know, run this function, take the output, feed into another function. It's very procedural. But when you, uh, all the abstractions in the, Open AI, open AI API, the uh, things like just everything else. Uh, there was nothing else really at the time, but even the new ones that have come out like Langchain that have sort of like taken the space by storm now um, are not really just trying to offer the minimal ingredient, which is the function. And to me, it was just like, if I can just offer the function, I can write a for loop. I can write, I can store a variable and then keep passing it into it. Uh, you could do so many different uh, uh emergent behaviors with just starting with the function and then simple Python uh, scripting on top of it. Yeah, some interesting stuff here, Lambda Prompt. So you can start, you can kind of start it um, 
said it's i don't know with chat gdp you can tell it a few things i'm going to ask you a question about a book okay uh, the book is a choose your own adventure book okay now here i'm gonna like you can prepare it right there's probably a, a more formal term for that but you can do this here like you can say hey system you are a type of bot <laughs> and then you cr that creates you an object that you can have a conversation with and you say what should we get for lunch and your type of bot is pirate and it's sort of say as a pirate i would suggest we have some hearty seafood or whatever right like that's that's beyond what you're doing with sketch i mean obviously this is not so much for code this is like conversing with python rather than in python i don't know in in your editor yeah, yeah. this um this one was uh, the open ai uh chat api endpoint came out and i was just like Oh, I should support it. So that's what this, uh, uh, I wanted to be able to ginger template inside of the conversation. So you can imagine a conversation yeah. that is prepared with like seven steps back and forth, but you want to hard code with the conversation, like how the flow of the conversation was going. And you want to template it so that like on message three, it put your new context problem on message mm -hmm. four, it put the output from another prompt that you ran on message five. It is this other data thing. And then you ask it to complete, uh, this, uh, the intent of like, it's arbitrarily complex, but still something like that would be, you know, just three lines or so in Lambda prompt. The idea was that yeah. it would offer up a really simple uh, API for this. Cool. And the other thing that's interesting is you have an async and a sync version. So that's that's cool. People can can check that out. Also a way to make it a hosted as a web service with say like fast API or something like that. Yeah. And yeah. you can make it a decorator if you like <laughs> an yeah. app prompt decorator. Yeah, on any function you can just throw at prompt and it it wraps it with the same class so that all the all the magic you get from that works. Um, the server bit is I took uh, so fast API has that sort of like inspection on the uh, function um, part. I did a little bit of middleware to get the two happy together, and then uh, all you have to do is import fast API uh, and then run you know G Unicorn that app and. Uh, it's two lines and any uh, any prompts you have made become their own independent uh, rest endpoint where you can just do a get or a post to it and uh, it, it returns the response uh, from calling the prompt. But these prompts can also be these chains of prompts. Like one prompt can call another prompt, which can call another right. prompt. And right. those prompts can call async to not async, back to async and things like that. And it should work. <laughs> Am I pretty sure. This one actually, I did test everything as far as I know. I'm pretty sure I've got pretty good coverage. So, yeah, super cool. All right. Well, getting a little short on time, but I, I think people are going to really, really dig this, especially Sketch. I think there's a lot of folks out there doing pandas that would love an AI buddy to help them do things like not just analyze the, the code, but the, the data as well. Yeah, just I think uh, anybody's I know it's for me, but it's just like Copilot in uh, VS Code IDE uh, sketch in your Jupyter IDE. It takes almost nothing to add. And you uh, whenever you're just sort of sitting there, you think you're about to alt tab to go to Google. You can just try the sketch.ask. And it's, it's surprising how often that sketch.ask or sketch.how to gets you way closer to a solution without even having to leave. The, you don't even have to leave your, your environment. <laughs> it's like a whole another level of autocomplete yeah. for yeah. sure. And super cool. All right. Now, before I let you out of here, you got to answer the final two questions. If you're going to write some Python code and it's not a Jupyter notebook, what editor are you using? It sounds to me like you may have just given a strong hint at what that might be. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, I've switched almost entirely to VS Code and uh, I've been really liking it with the remote development and uh, like just I, I work across like uh, many machines, both cloud and local, and some like five, six different machines are my like primary working machines. And I use the remote uh, VS Code thing, and it, it just I have a unified environment that gives me terminal, the files, and the code all in one, and Copilot yeah. on all of them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's wild. All right, and then notable PyPI package. I mean, pip install sketch. You can throw that out there if you like. Uh, it's pretty awesome. But anything you've run across, you're like, oh, this is people should know about this. Yeah, doesn't have see. to be popular. Just like, wow, this is cool. In the, uh, I guess these these two are very popular. But uh, in the the data space, uh, I really I'm a huge fan of uh, Ray and uh, also Arrow. Like I mm -hmm. use those two tools as like my backend bread and butter for everything I do. And so those have just been really great uh, workhorses. Apache <laughs> Arrow, right? Yes. And then yeah. Ray, I'm not sure. Yeah. Ray is a distributed. Uh, uh, 
scheduling compute framework. It's sort of like a, right, uh, right, I don't right, know what right. they. Um, yeah, I remember seeing about this. Yeah. This is, uh, it is, I, I'm parsing, uh, we didn't talk about other things, but I'm like parsing common crawl, which is like 25 petabytes of data. And uh, Ray is great. It's just a workhorse. It power uh, is really useful. Like I find it's so snappy and good, but it offers everything I need in a distributed environment. So I can write code that runs on a hundred machines and not have to think about it. It works really well. That's that's pretty nuts. Not as nuts as chat GDP and mid journey, but <laughs> still pretty nuts. So yep. uh, before we call it a date, do you want to just tell people about approximate labs? It sounds like you guys are making some good progress. Uh, might have yep. some, some jobs for people to work in this kind of area as well. Yeah, so uh, we're we're working at the intersection of uh, AI and tabular data. So anything related to these training, these large language models, and also uh, tabular data. So things with columns and rows. Uh, we are trying to like solve that problem. Uh, try and bridge the gap here because there's a pretty big gap. Uh, we are uh, we have three main initiatives that we're working on, which is we're trying to build up the data set of data sets. So just like the pile or uh, the stack or lay on 5b these like big data sets that were used to train all these big models we're making our own on tabular data uh we are training models so this is actually training large uh language models doing these training these full transformer models uh and then we're also building apps like sketch like uis things that are actually there to help uh make data more accessible to people so anything that helps people get value from data uh and make it open source that's what we're working on uh we just uh raised our seed round. So we are now officially hiring. So uh, uh, looking for people who are interested in the space and who are enthusiastic about these problems. Awesome. Well, uh, very exciting demo libraries, I guess, <laughs> however you call them. But I think this, I think these are neat. People are going to find a lot of uh, cool uses for them. So uh, excellent work and congrats on all this, the success so far. It sounds like you're Thank just you. starting to take off. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Justin, final call to action. People want to get started. Let's pick Sketch. Uh, people want to get started with Sketch. What do you tell them? Uh, just uh, pip install it. <laughs> give, give, Sketch a, uh, give Sketch a try, pip install it, import it, and then throw it on your data frame. Awesome. And then ask it questions yeah. or how-tos, yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever you like. Uh, if, you really, if you really want to and you, you trust the model, like throw some uh, applies and have it clean your data for you. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for being on the show. Come in here. Thank and you. Tell us about all your work. It's great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks yeah. See you later.